Please join me here on stage. Uh, welcome to the audience. Um, we're very much looking forward to this panel on decentralized exchanges. So please uh, take a seat and I will leave it to my panelists to introduce themselves. Should I start? Yeah, perfect. Hi, um, my name is Christoph. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Fiat Finance. At Fiat Finance, we offer a, a compliant, easy and transparent crypto Earn product that we integrate with um, <clears throat> with centralized exchanges so that their customers can earn on their crypto very easily and we actually make yields by providing liquidity to decentralized exchanges and that puts us in the position uh, in a very unique position between decentralized exchanges on the one hand for providing liquidity and centralized exchanges and that's why I'm very excited for this panel here. Hi, so I'm Jana Fanasi, like Magdalena, I used to work in the traditional finance. I was the uh, chief compliance officer for PayPal in Europe and um, for, for regional compliance. And my first crypto project started in 2016. It was Bitflyer, the Japanese exchange. And ever since as I've been in the crypto space supporting startups, co-founding startups. Uh, helping them with regulatory recognition and reputation and licensing and it's been quite a journey <laughs> there is always something going on people never run out of trouble so <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's good to be here so i'm next so i'm dr firas havach i'm the head of compliance at signum have um, now been at signum for over a year and a half before was the head of compliance for corporate investment banking at jp morgan before that, had my stint at Deutsche. So I moved from TradFi to the crypto world. And ironically, I shared the opinion of Jamie Dimon before. <laughs> and then during my time at JP Morgan, I, I actually got into the crypto sphere. Um, I think I can blame COVID for having a bit more time and then uh, digging into it. So moving beyond just the definition of what is the blockchain, but rather what are the use cases. And I ended up at Signum. And here I am. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michel Chabin. I'm the Chief Operating Officer from Edelcoin. Beside that, I'm a board member from Cookija in the aviation sector. Additionally, I have my own enterprises serving in AI um, developments and consulting for diverse companies and governmental entities, mainly in the Middle East. I have a legal background. I started my career as a judge in Austria then moved to the financial sector, where I had been a fund manager for a major pension fund. But this led me to my own ventures. And actually, for quite a while, I'm more heavily involved in the crypto sphere, especially with our project Edelcoin, which is an asset-backed payment token issued here in Switzerland. And pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks for the audience for taking the time to be here. So decentralized finance is unimaginable without decentralized exchanges. And I looked into some very recent numbers uh, as of today. So we, when we look at the TVL total uh, value locked in DeFi across all chains, uh, chains, as of today, we stand at 58 billion US dollars. Out of that number, 25% is attributable to decentralized exchanges. Since the beginning of 2024, we had a trading volume of 52 billion across the tw top 20 decentralized exchanges and st spot trade volume and DEXs amounts to roughly 11% compared to uh, centralized crypto exchanges, which is uh, compared to the all time high of uh, trading volume on decentralized exchanges uh, last year in June was 22%. So um, the reason for the high uh, trading volume on decentralized exchanges last year was uh, that the SEC went after uh, Coinbase and Binance. So SEC uh, has made some uh, uh, headlines also with um, approving uh, exchange traded funds um, lately. When we look at uh, decentralized finance and, and decentralized exchanges, what comes, um, what is a very interesting topic is the level of decentralized decentralization and also some regular 
regulatory components or aspects of that. And I would like to ask uh, Christoph if you um, can share your uh, experience and, and opinion when it comes to the level of decentralization um, for decentralized exchanges. <clears throat> yeah, in the, in the regulatory. In the uh, regulatory. Framework. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm, I'm from Germany and therefore I know only a little bit about the uh, regulation in Germany, but there, um, actually, I, um, the BaFin had um, a conference in September, the BaFin Tech Conference, and there they talked about um, how they are tending to regulate also decentralized organizations and, and uh, especially also DAXs. And um, so I think the key issue to understand is that um, regulation is regulating services and not technology. And um, DEXs and also other decentralized protocols are offering services which are somehow subject to regula re re regulation in other fields. And um, so that's why they announced that they, um, that they will also pursue regulation for decentralized companies as long as they're a team or um, a core person that runs that organization that is actually responsible for what's happening there and makes decision and that is n so if if a, if a dex is not purely regulated not in terms of technology that they are using smart contracts in order to do their services but that there's a team that takes key decisions then the, also that team is subject to regulation i think that's very important to know and also to to keep in mind when you are offering services even in a deregu uh, in a, in a um, in a decentralized environment. Thank you very much for that interesting insight. Um, I think it's always very important to assess the level of decentralization because uh, regulators uh, might look into that and uh, properly check if it is really truly decentralized or if there are some centralized components behind which might be subject to regulation. If we now, Michelle, you're also uh, a lot in Abu Dhabi or in the United Arab Emirates, what is the approach of the regulator there in that region when it comes to decentralized exchanges? In general, let's say UAE is, that sounds completely different to, let's say, like a country like Germany or Switzerland. You don't have a single entity which is responsible for regulations. You have, on the one hand, you have the state level, which is the United Arab Emirates. And on the other hand, you have the single entity, the single Emirates. And in the Emirates, you then have also some special free zones like the ADGM, which is in Abu Dhabi. You have in Dubai, you have the DIFC. You have also now the establishments at the DMCC. And all of them have, on the one hand, yes, you have the central approach from the United Arab Emirates, which gives under the central bank and the SCA guideline for regulating virtual asset services. But then you have also, which I like, for example, in Abu Dhabi, the approach, which they launched, I believe, last year. And I think also Coinbase did a project there with the Rec Lab, where you have a regulatory environment, more like a sandbox test environment, where they started for tokenizing different assets. So compared to that, they have an interesting approach. Also, Rak Dao from Russell Kaime increased now and introduced now last year their new infrastructure for legalizing different, um, let's say, licenses in terms of and trade exchange, also with the aspect of tokenizing services, tokenizing real-world assets, but mainly also in the AI sector, healthcare sector, aviation sector. But what you can see definitely in the UAE that, especially VARA in UAE takes now really serious steps and approaches to follow up illicit and non-licensed traders, brokers or exchanges and gives explicitly warnings to the public where Entities which are not licensed by VARA have basically to stop their activities and VARA takes action against. So we see more and more developments. So that would mean for a decentralized exchange, if there are some centralized components and if they're conducting um, financial services, then they Need could... Need to be legalized. Okay. And if they are not legalized, they get a warning and they will have 
to trace. Okay, that's a very interesting the approach. The regulatory framework there. Um, thank you very much for these insights, Michel. Um, when we now look at the European Union and uh, with the upcoming regulation there, market in crypto asset regulation, which will be uh, applicable from this year in June, respectively, and of December this year, uh, decentralized exchanges are not in the scope. Um, of, of the Mika directly. Nonetheless, uh, it might have an impact on decentralized exchanges. Firas, could you maybe elaborate on how the uh, new EU crypto regulation could impact decentralized uh, exchanges in the European Union? So, uh, I think you kind of have to paint a picture on what, what, what they're trying to do. Um, I, I'm in a fortunate position to look after Switzerland, Abu Dhabi, Singapore, Luxembourg, and then all the other expansion efforts of the bank. So my main criteria is to find the gold standard or kind of this convergence of regulations that you need to seek. Now, even before Mika, um, as I mean, you have various considerations. I mean, we spoke about the definition of securities, um, a definition of uh, decentralization at the beginning as well. I think after watching the SEC deliberations of the year, I think half of us are becoming experts in terms of the level of decentralization, given that it's part of the Howey test, but every, putting everything into perspective, regardless of how you define a token, if you're offering a service to a customer, now speaking as a bank, and you have a myriad of definitions, one of the definitions is you're offering or selling a security. Now, from a Swiss perspective, from a MIFID, from a traditional perspective, as soon as you start offering are uh, not actively, but uh, offering the trading opportunity to trade securities, you have an obligation for traders to be recorded. Now, with that myriad of classifications out there, am I gonna put a button for the trader to kind of push whenever, okay, this is a utility token, I'll, I'll, I don't need to record them, but I'll record them when I, it is a security token. You kind of have this convergence of, let's do something consistently, and then already you're getting indications of what, what is the pursuit of this recording? You're covering your own liability, you're kind of uh, protecting the customer. I think Mika is going into that direction of formalizing that con consumer protection mechanism that you already have in the TradFi uh, perspective. Um, you're kind of formalizing the transparency um, objectives of it. So I think the regulations are just really catching up to the decentralized and then and, and the crypto world uh, that we have out there. So what, what, Mika, doesn't define DeFi, but it kind of sets the tone for it. It doesn't set the tone for what DEX should be doing. But as soon as you're doing something which could be equi um, equivalent to a security, then you've got a pretty clear idea of what you should be doing if you're pursuing a regulated position. Obviously, we still ha are, have the navigation of the various regulators and the various jurisdictions. What do they need to do? I mean, another, I mean, because you mentioned it, another example is I'm also on the board of a of the world's first yield-bearing stablecoin, uh, and, and they, they, they pursue the regulation with the Bermuda Monetary Authority in issuing such a stablecoin for many of the regulators in Europe means you need to identify the counterparties all along the way. You cannot have a wallet which is unidentified. That's the current understanding. Some perspectives are still different. So you still have that convergence. And I think the future in terms of what Mika kind of introduced will kind of find its way into the other regulators as well. So what do you say that means then that DEXs will eventually need to identify every of their customers? I think, and, and then the example I drew with the Austrian regulator once in, in a panel was, if I buy myself a sandwich, I don't expect to be identified by buying that sandwich. I expect to be identified at the beginning and at the end of the kind of withdrawal or deposit or on-ramping, off-ramping point. Of course, we have the advantage of the blockchain where you can monitor the kind of shady activity that happens in between. You can't do that in the fiat world. So in German, there's a saying, the Kirche im Dorf lassen. <laughs> um, so, leave, so translated in English, leave the church in the town. Uh, but in any case, you can overdo it. But you have the advantages of the blockchain, so why not? But you don't need to overdo it. What you need to do is to ensure that the endpoints and the beginning points are covered for sure, because that's where you can prevent it from being 
put back into the system if something in between happened. That's at least one kind of expectation, but you know, we're still navigating, we're still learning. I think with the technology that we're developing, you have the elliptics, the corn firms, the chain analysis, etc. You have so many other providers out there that kind of give you the tools to do that. And I think as soon as they become a bit more sophisticated, as soon as the regulators start recognizing their activities, I think that should become a bit more clear cut might be a condition of the regulations down the line, but I think that would kind of paint the future picture of it. Yeah, I have. Sorry. sorry. I have a metaphor for this, and actually, this metaphor is kind of inspired by one of my clients. He owns a crypto business, but also he owns like a CBD business in in the legal marijuana space. And I feel like DeFi and this Dexes and legalization of marijuana they have the same regulatory path where you don't have the presumption of innocence. Whenever you're doing something in this space that is a bit whatever, questionable, you have a, almost like a duty to showcase and prove that you are uh, safe, uh, that you are not harming people, that you don't have to be regulated or whatever the case is. So there are many industries where presumption of innocence applies and the cases of DeFi, I believe it's the opposite in most countries. <laughs> That's actually a very interesting point you're crossing uh, or touching upon, uh, Jana. Um, in dubio pro reo, as uh, all <laughs> lawyers love to say, uh, 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 not guilty in case of doubt. Um, when we look at like why maybe that is that uh, decent life exchanges are perceived in such a way. What would be some vulnerabilities um, and maybe critical aspects um, of uh, decent life exchanges based on your experience um, and what you have seen in the industry? Um, well, I've seen a lot, <laughs> <laughs> but you've been a while in the space. <laughs> let's kind of narrow it down. So. Um, I believe Brian mentioned the crypto heroes, right? And I believe crypto follows a path of many innovations where in the beginning you start something and it's kind of under the radar, nobody notices, regulators feel like it doesn't impact a lot of people. Most people who have access to crypto, they know what they're doing, so we don't really need to act. Then somebody gets hurt, like big time, like ICOs and stuff. And then regulators suddenly, oh, we have to do something, we have to act, we have to look responsible, like, you know. And then they, they, they have a tendency to overreact because it's easy to ban everything rather than calibrate. And after a while, there is this calibration occurs where people say, well, this is safe, this is not safe, this is the best standards, whatever the case is. And kind of industry and regulatory environment, they discover what is the middle ground, hopefully. But not guaranteed, right? Especially if you are in some countries. Um, so I believe, and I had an opportunity to talk to regulators from many countries that block, ban, or somehow discourage crypto. They actually went not on record. They don't care about like IML, seriously. What they care about, that people lose money because of hacking or like, human stupidity, um, laziness, whatever. So I believe that the main vulnerabilities of DEXs come from like two scenarios. One is they get hacked or because they're like a honeypot. And second, they, they enable huge cri crime to happen, like whatever, uh, North Korean money, Russian money, you name it. So those are the two things that may happen that may have a big impact and may force regulators to act quickly and potentially overreact. And um, in the recent history, we have seen this curve hack, which <laughs> goes back to this interesting point, how decentralized the DEXs really are. Because if you remember, curve was hacked, but then the founder was able to, and the team, they were able to actually decide which pools can continue operating, which pools had to be halted. They decided what kind of method they would use to fix the vulnerability. They decided when they can go back. They decided how to maintain the pools. They decided where to get liquidity. They even, there were, there were some things that they, they tried to kind of make uh, 
trades for the curve token to maintain the price of curve because that was the problem as a, in terms of collateral. So they, they were able to do a lot of shit, right? To solve the problem. But then, like, if they go back and say, well, we're actually decentralized, we don't have any centralized authority, like, who would believe them <laughs> in their street mind? So that, that was the problem. <laughs> I mean, I love how, uh, frankly, we speak here, we call a spade a spade. Um, and I think that example that you bring is very interesting because it, um, it really addresses if, if after a hack, a tech team behind can decide which pools continue, which are not uh, um, active anymore, then we really have to ask ourselves, like, how decentralized is DeFi actually or decentralized exchanges and and what is happening behind the scenes when we now yeah but it's not to say that they did the wrong thing I think they did the right thing yeah they of course intervene. but uh, but <laughs> then uh, let's not call this decentralized uh, I know, exchanges right? <laughs> uh, but let's uh, reconsider uh, uh, a proper definition for that um, when we one more back going to the vulnerabilities where you mentioned hacks so I mean when some project fails in the financial world, like also in traditional banking, it can be a technical component behind that fails, or it can be a human element behind that fails. We have seen both in the in the traditional world. When we now look at, uh, at decentralized exchanges, I mean, this question is applicable to all of you. What would you say is like a failure? What fails more often or are we like balanced there? Is it like the technical components, like a smart contract that was not properly um, set up? Or is it like some human element behind like uh, one uh, founder taking in all, all the assets? What, what would you say there? What have you observed? Well, what I observed is human errors or human laziness um, account for small mistakes but a lot of them and the, like technical errors they invite huge abuse or op opportunity to exploit that was my kind of observation of the industry but i don't have the data to support it it's anecdotal okay Firas, i saw yeah, your yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to uh navigate or sort the thoughts so maybe if we if we and I'm a mathematician and economist, and not a lawyer. Um, so if we go by the statistics and, and, and the recent developments that we've seen in the media, I mean, the, the accusations that you've had with DEXs, semi-DEXs, quasi-DEXs, or actual DEXs, I mean, you see also this transitioning into this attempt to really be decentralized in terms of, I've seen projects out there creating a smart contract and then throwing the keys away so that contract can't be manipulated or, or kind of enhanced or access to the liquidity pools changes. So I think the, the primary criteria is to have that trust and the faith in a smart contract it, behind it. And then those interacting with it are not controlled or incentivized other than by the virtue of the code. So I think that is the viability of, of, of a DEX. And now obviously, is there a central authority to validate the, the uh, functioning of the DEX? Um, is there somebody who validates the trustworthiness and the, and the true loss of the access to the, to the liquidity pools? And, and, and I think many of the scams that we have seen out there were just, you know, pump and dumps, uh, etc. At least the ones that caught my attention, because uh, I'm supposed to be paranoid in that sphere. Mm -hmm. but, a set of compliance uh, for sure, yes. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I think this is what, what many people are, are looking for, the, the, the definition of trust and true decentralization and the interaction with just the code. And I think this is what the origins of the blockchain really were, just getting engaged with that. But can, is there a central authority to kind of give you that confidence? Uh, we, we, we need to verify on. I, 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 just to add on to this, like also what you said before, I think it, the decentralization of an of an exchange is twofold. The one would be technically, so I'm running my system on smart contracts, and those are uh, on the blockchain and can be manipulated later on. And then uh, who runs the, uh, the 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 DEX on a on a management basis? Who makes decisions and how powerful can they be? And I think. Most of the DEXs that I know would be decentralized on the technical side, yes, but not on the management or team side. And um, then also, like answering the question, I think um, that since the tech 
technical side mostly is decentralized, I think the biggest threat comes from the smart contract hacks. So it's technically and not human based, in, in, like in my view, but also just like I don't, also don't have any numbers. <laughs> Thank you so much for these insights. Christoph, actually, I would like to stay with you. Um, it's interesting what you mentioned because uh, recently you told me about a German uh, startup, Unstoppable Finance, a DeFi wallet provider, and uh, they had to postpone the rollout uh, of their um, mobile wallet, uh, Ultimate, uh, called Ultimate, um, as they were in disagreement with the German regulator BaFin. Maybe you can provide some insights on that very interesting case of uh, decentralized uh, uh, finance or decentralized exchange. Yeah, uh, it is indeed a very interesting uh, project and I like it very much. Um, so it's not a DAX, it's a wallet. Um, but they had the challenge when uh, designing the wallet, they wanted to offer um, DeFi for the masters as a, they call it co-pilot for DeFi. And they um, invented a wallet which is very easy to use, um, also for non-crypto natives. And they wanted to include a range of DeFi protocols for easy usage within their app. Um, and then the challenge was that Barfin said, like, okay guys, if you are including that curated list of protocols in the app and if you're making it easily accessible um, by showing prices, by showing different pools, then you're actually, um, you're, you're actually subject to regulation because that's investment brokerage. Um, and so what this wallet made was actually giving access for retail to DAXs to trade on DAXs. And that was, according to BaFin, something which needs to be regulated. Um, so they then cancelled um, those services in that app. And now in Germany, you have a very um, poor app because it doesn't have all those services. But then what I like very much about that project is that what, how they reacted to it wasn't that they said, okay, we get an investment brokerage license or we don't do it at all. But they said, okay, we just do the big shit and we uh, run for a banking license. And um, so now they're trying to be a bank and I think they will succeed. So they're going to be the first DeFi bank and that's going to be really exciting um, because they can then offer products like, for example, uncollateralized loans on chain, or they can resell security tokens in that wallet. Um, so that gives them um, the possibility to resell tokenized real world assets or very interesting products like tokenized DeFi use strategies from Fiat Finance. I mean, when I hear DeFi bag, it's, it's uh it's a cognitive dissonance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's like, okay, a very interesting. I mean, expect the unexpected in crypto. This is what I have learned over the uh, past five and a half years. But uh, let's see uh, how that project will go. I'm very curious uh, to see on the further developments. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's very indicative of where the whole DeFi space might go, actually. Because, I mean, offering forms of financial intermediation is... I mean, the regulators will jump on that uh, train for sure. And I think that could be a very interesting first uh, use case, the DeFi bank uh, to see there. Um, Michael, I would like to um, ask you about, um, there is a very interesting Bloomberg report from uh, last year in September on uh, trade surveillance data from uh, Solidus Labs. And uh, they looked at uh, liquidity providers that are ethereum based um, dexes and they have wash traded at least two billion worth of cryptocurrency um, manipulating the prices volumes of more than twenty thousand tokens um, and the lps have ex executed wash trades uh, in 67 percent of almost thirty thousand liquidity pools on decentralized exchanges i mean these are some uh, impressive impressive numbers what challenges do you see exist uh, in the decentralized exchange ecosystem um, when it comes to detecting, preventing such uh, manipulative activities um, like wash trading and what challenges do you see Do you see there? And is, is it in uh, any form comparable to traditional finance to trade by? In general, so to say, carried up from the overall perspective for market manipulation, we have different activities for market manipulation. We have, as you said, we have the wash trade, we have the agreed trading between different parties, we have inside deals, etc. When it comes now to really the wash trading, I think this is definitely an 
illicit activity which a regulator wants to see that a sort of regulation will start even on the taxes, on the decentralized exchanges, because as you saw, these are the known numbers. And But on the other hand, I believe as it's somehow potentially similar to the dark web, the dark web is not on by default still online and nothing is acting against because it's giving away much insights for the let's say different entities which have a need to investigate and do the surveillance even on the dark web also the blockchain um, gives a clear insight whether it's on a DEX or a tax you just need to have on the one hand really technical capability, financial capability, human resource, analytical techniques, and as well the manpower to track and trace such illicit activities. And this is something definitely that needs to be done in my opinion, but I'm not sure on what level it will come up. You have now a huge market in that sense, where you have companies who act in that field, mainly from the military intelligence forces who got to the private market and offer the services for track and tracing to redeem certain funds which disappeared through the blockchain areas. And they are quite good in the market, who have a success rate plus 90%. And I see, not to give you a clear answer, if it goes a drive into regulation or if it's a welcomed unregulated area because to keep them thinking it's a safe place and a safe harbor where at least we have some traction into the system and have a, some entry points where we can track and trace to diverse groups who will either do it in a small circle or we also see on a governmental level who have the abilities to do wash trading to increase values for their sole benefit. Okay, thank you for that insight. When we compare that to traditional finance? Um, or traditional how finance faces the same problem as before. We have a purely good regulated market in that sense. When it comes to stock market activities, when you have, let's say I'm a company, I'm doing some, some, some interesting, all of the best case now, social media, social media hacks. When Twitter, something is happening, I don't know if it can say now tweet or you have to say X, you do something axing. Uh, if something is tweeted online, it has to be sure that it's gone to the public. If it hasn't gone to the public on a broader sense, yes, you will have issues with the buffing, as an example. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Firas, uh, I like, uh, I mean, you're head of compliance. Uh, so when it comes to that type of activity, I mean, compliance has many different aspects. It's not just AML, KYC, but like uh, insider trading. I know this is one of your favorite topics um, uh, or wash trades. What would be your view uh, on that when it comes to decentralized exchanges? I mean, it's it's in inherently a lot more complex than what the TradFi um sphere encompasses. I mean, in, if, if I look back at the, the surveillance mechanisms and systems that I had at my fingertips, I had a countless number of people being able to report level one, level two reports to me saying, okay, there is something we reported at time X, just as a pre-announcement for an M&A transaction, or uh, there's this Bloomberg article which confirmed this. You can go back in time in terms of seeing when which counterparts traded during the trading hours during the day, and you had the news cycles, etc., to align with it, or you'd have your own inside kind of communication surveillance. You had your own bubble, your own ecosystem, and and many of the regulators, Bafin included. Uh, the Austin FMA and various ones in Europe also get pre-announcements about sensitive information and then they monitor each transaction. So if you were to transact coincidentally a certain stock um, and that coincides with a sensitive uh, 
uh, announcement down the line, you could be accused indirectly of performing insider dealing, but you have the bank, at least if you're employed at one, to kind of say, no, we pre-cleared it or not. In the crypto world, you don't have that. You have numerous announcements, you have numerous channels to monitor, you have a lot more volume that goes through on average over time mm -hmm. if we disregard fixed income. I mean, uh, of course, but you, can you set up an appropriate surveillance mechanism? You can focus on an ecosystem. You need to focus on a blockchain. You need to focus on which communication channels are broad enough or which ones are not broad enough. So I have so many criteria to kind of consider. I think Mika, because we addressed it before, goes into that direction of kind of transparency obligations. If you as a blockchain developer, regardless of how you're kind of classified, let's say you're a utility token, or let's go to the extreme, you're a security token, um, you will have to, at some point, make pre-announcements to the respective regulators. But then the question becomes, okay, this is the EU, but blockchains are rather, I mean, multinational. Which regulator do I inform all of them? Do I just, I, I think I'll be spamming at one point, or I'll be blocked by, by the various email providers. But, you know, this is the kind of exploration that we all need to do in terms of the, the, I mean, and, and then the Twitter scenario is particularly um, amusing, uh, seeing how it kind of uh, developed as well and kind of what it flagged. But, you know, it is an indication. You monitor Twitter uh, or X. Um, <laughs> you monitor Discord. You monitor Telegram, etc. But can you really do that? Uh, yeah, I think the question here is like, what should be done and what is feasible or realistic from, from a... Um, um, implementation point of view. I mean, uh, any announcement in the crypto world, de depending from whom it comes, uh, let's say Elon Musk, it, uh, it always has a huge impact on the industry and, and uh, price developments. Um, as you said correctly, like we have, we have this but borderless... ironically, to interject, I mean, if we look at Trump tweets and uh, how he kind of uh, trashed Amazon, I mean, if we, if we bash the communication mechanism, we bash the communication mechanism, but it is not crypto specific or it's not TradFi specific. And Trump, I mean, also in his miracle, um, uh, mystical ways, kind of manipulated the markets that way. Huh? That's a very good uh, comparison, actually, um, to, to bring that up. Um, I lost my previous thought. I'm Never really mind. <laughs> well, if I could add. Uh, yes, like, please. <laughs> happens. <laughs> I think in terms of manipulation, a lot of people say a lot of things and the intent is not always there, but where I would focus my attention if I were to detect um, manipulation or kind of price fixing would be founders tokens. They have a lot of them and sometimes they do have private secret deals, especially if they get into trouble. So that like Twitter, I mean, it's peanuts. Founders tokens is the big deal. <laughs> Okay, my thought is back. Thank you for for that, Jan. <laughs> my thought came back. Okay, um, actually, I wanted to touch upon what Fira said because um, I think one of the challenges when it comes to market manipulation um, in in DeFi is that the borderless um, character of of decentralized finance or of crypto assets it is a challenge to the fragmented national regulatory approaches that we see across the world. So we have this borderless blockchain technology with the crypto assets and decentralized exchanges, and then we have this fragmented regulatory national approaches, um, and they're trying to find local solutions to a global topic. I think this is maybe also one of the reasons why it is not easy to solve, uh, to solve uh, that topic in, in, in DeFi. Um, Jana, back to you. I mean, you were with PayPal as head of Compliance Europe uh, some years back, and you also uh, today mentioned the Curve case. So um, I read a recent article in Coindesk from beginning of January this year, and they reported that PayPal stablecoin forms part of the third largest liquidity pool on Curve, um, and it's uh, Curve's Frex PYUSD liquidity pool, um, which went live on December last year, and in, it comprises PayPal's dollar-backed stablecoin PYUSD. Um, Boasting 135 million in total value locked. That's nothing. Um, excuse me? That's nothing. Well, 
compared to uh, other okay. other protocols it's not but i mean paypal is a traditional company yeah. and um it's it's very interesting that they went into crypto that they also have their own stable coin can you maybe elaborate on the role and importance of stable coin uh, stable coins in uh, decentralized exchanges sure just preface anything i'm saying now i have no insights into paypal it's like i'm making stuff up right <laughs> <laughs> so i do believe that paypal in payments is something like microsoft in their office space in in a way that they don't innovate, but they want to be seen in innovative, right? So they acquire companies or they join projects. So I don't believe that PayPal stablecoin has a particular vision or a unique uh, technology or anything that is groundbreaking. Sorry, PayPal, you don't. <laughs> well, but it's not the point. So I think that they just decided to do it because they wanted to see if it works and i know why because the data was published so before when they made uh, crypto available to paypal users uh, through paypal wallet people who had crypto actually logged in into their paypal accounts they were checking the price of crypto like 10 times more so, so they were more engaged users they are more likely to transact they spent more and it was kind of an indication probably for PayPal to say, okay, we have to do something in crypto, not because we care about crypto, they probably don't, but they see it as a way to activate other users and potentially make more money. So that's kind of how I, I see it, but I don't think PayPal would be, um, and first, <laughs> funnily enough, PayPal is very like risk averse company, but because of this, pay why usd they actually got subpoenaed by the sec but i mean if you don't get subpoenaed by sec you're probably doing nothing so it's not <laughs> it's not really an indicator but the point is that i don't expect paypal to be super risky or original in that space i don't really know the reason why the uh, pool was so big but what i checked is that the trading volume is like five million a week like so somebody just keeps money in this pool, but it's not very active based on what I checked. I don't know why or who, but given that it's just one pool and money doesn't move, isn't very impressive. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, maybe I can add some, something on the numbers. So PayPal stablecoin currently is at approximately 295 million and is then uh, comes 10th compared to the other top three uh, stablecoins by market cap, which are USDT with 95 billion, which is a different number, uh, USDC with 25 billion and uh, DAI with 5 billion market cap. Yeah, so the, probably there is a niche market there, but what I kind of feel is interesting is the role of stable coins in DeFi and especially in DEX's operations. Hopefully we will move into this area because I do have a theory about that. Yeah, please, please elaborate on it. <laughs> okay. Very curious to hear. So, like I said, regulators are very suspicious about DEXs. I mean, I know it is anecdotally, but some of them told me. And I do believe one of the ways how they can attack DEXs indirectly, uh, because in most cases they wouldn't have direct jurisdiction. So either they need to somebody get hurt first and complain, and then they would intervene, or they would, because most of the stablecoin issuers, they have regulations, right? So PayPal token is issued by Paxos, Paxos is regulated, Circle is regulated. So. At some point, I wouldn't be surprised at all if these issuers would become would be made responsible for where they make their tokens available, or they would be asked to somehow, I don't know, de deactivate is not the right word, but apply some technical restrictions to certain tokens at certain DEXs who interacted with certain wallets. It was already a case they tried it with Tornado Cash. I, they're not going to stop. So I do believe that stablecoin issuers would be a, an avenue, a conduit of how uh, regulators may potentially try to influence what is made available on taxes. Maybe just a quick thought. Uh, my theory about PayPal is they just saw how much money Tether was making, so they want to do the same. Maybe the other theory I have, I mean, 
and this is a known fact, the blockchain is fueled by stable coins. So that's how you bring the liquidity in. Um, at the end of the day, um, I mean, it's it, now, the, now the question becomes, do you really deactivate it? Do you have any control over it? I think partially you could argue that uh, politics of any jurisdiction would be incentivized about the, the usage and how much of that fund is really locked up on the blockchain. Um, but uh, I'm just throwing in some provocative thoughts out there. So yeah, but you, you actually, you, your theory has merit. Look what happened with Paxos, who you should Binance USD. You don't need to look far. And then, I mean, maybe if we draw a parallel, I, and, and sorry, I, I really want the other speakers to also speak, but, but the Swiss Bankers Association also put up a, a, a working group to evaluate an equivalent. So you have stable coins, CBDCs, deposit tokens, etc. They obviously, banks also saw, and Swiss banks also saw the merit in locking up funds because you get this juicy thing called interest rates at the end of it and and so they're evaluating deposit tokens obviously the regulatory scrutiny is a lot stricter than in this mystical unicorn universe that is the blockchain but uh, there is an interest to kind of unlock it somehow um, but I, I think the liquidity is rooted in the stablecoin uh, area and dex is therefore also so it all will play in together mika issues restrictions on the stable coins you're not allowed to be a yield bearing stable coin issuer in the eu um it's not if if it's asset backed you need to have certain disclosures etc etc so yeah fascinating but sorry <laughs> so if i take what you say um would that mean or would then um the statement be like um, stable coins are a fuel, a driver of decentralized exchanges and players like PayPal come in because of the monetary interest component they see in, in this space or would it be because they're thrilled about the technology and the use cases that it is enabling? It was a rhetorical question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, if we look at the numbers, uh, because you said that uh, Tether, they wanted to do, uh, um, it's also have a, a piece of the pie uh, of, of Tether. Um, yeah, so it's uh, possibly uh, the driver uh, behind. If we now uh, look into the future, or uh, for you maybe, um, Firas, um, the EU has not yet um, made DeFi uh, subject to, to regulation. So Mark Foster, the EU policy lead at the Crypto Council for Innovation, stated that the European Union, uh, the European Commission, sorry, will be mandated under Mika to develop a, a detailed report assessing the pros and cons of, of DeFi in the near future. Um, based on your experience as head of compliance of a regulated digital asset native bank, what would you say um, or what you consider the top three elements um, to be relevant for future regulation when it comes to decentralized exchanges? I think I think it plays into what Christoph and every, everyone really on the panel said. And then I think the the key elements are the convergence that we have, the the, the gold standard, uh, because I mean, is there one law that I can use in, um, uh, in, 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 in decentralized land or not? Uh, I, I think just getting this consistent set of expectations then the second one is obviously regaining and maintaining that trust. So it go, trust goes two ways. So if I it willingly want to do something shady and I willingly want to manipulate the markets, I am one of the very few who might see an opportunity, but the vast majority of people who want to use, use the blockchain don't want to do the illicit stuff. They're convinced by the technology. So you want to get their trust and kind of emphasize that. And then and a third perspective is just building on the experiences where, where as, as we move along, we get a bit smarter how we engage with the blockchain. I mean, the EU today announced their new uh, considerations with regard to uh, unhosted wallets or ledger devices. What is the expectation on banks on, on accepting those to on an off ramp? I mean, for, for, for Swiss banks, it's trivial. You need to adhere to the tra travel rules, so you need to identify yourself. But what are the next levels? And I think experience will show. I think we've had that experience with staking as well as an example, where at the beginning we thought, okay, 
staking is okay, then briefly it wasn't okay, and then it was okay again. Um, but you know, you're learning by doing, and I think this goes into the market manipulation side of things. How do you monitor it? We can only get smart over time. I think it goes into that Baffin example that you also gave a DeFi bank. I think it will go into that kind of quasi DeFi DEX kind of element down the line. Huh? Um, Christoph and Mike, Michel, maybe from your like crypto 2030, if we now take 2030 as the year, um, what, based on your um, look into the future, what do you think decentralized exchanges will look like in, in a couple of years uh, from, from now? Spontaneous, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> Um, so I think that um, the technology, te technology will prevail and that uh, actually the, the blockchain and, um, and having smart contracts that are executing automatically and then in, in a predefined manner transaction on the blockchain and that is, that's enabling um, trading in a very efficient way and the concept of liquidity pools will prevail and I think that's, that's uh, the big chance of, of, of taxes. Um, uh, what I think will be like at least in the in the um, more regulated markets, it will be harder for decentralized exchanges to offer it permissionless. So I think we will see some kind of a permissioned um, tax where you combine the advantages of the technology, easy trading, fast trading, efficient trading, um, with uh, compliance, so that also taxes will I think need to. KYC um, their customers and they will need to have some kind of licenses in order to offer their business. Um, it won't happen tomorrow, but I think in 2030 um, we'll see something like that. And that also then enables um, traditional finance and the big money to go into those liquidity pools and into DEXs because they can then also manage their counterparty risks. Thank you very yeah. much for that very interesting vision that uh, I would say I share. Michelle, I'm very curious to hear about yours. No, definitely. I agree with my colleagues that the long future definitely will, will go into more regulatory aspect. But from my opinion, I'm not sure what will be way much faster. Is it the regulatory aspect or is it the tech? Because nowadays we see a lot of developments in sort of AI developments or AGI developments, but also from the aspect of quantum computing. Yes, quantum computing is now at the early beginning, but definitely we will see quantum computing either in five years, in 10 years, probably 2030. And when it comes to quantum computing and AGI, I believe the tech will overrule definitely the need for regulation because the tech will be already there that it will be sorted out by the tech. Um, I think you're making a very interesting statement. Um, I think law is never as fast as the technological development. It always has the um, a tendency to be a bit retrospective. So I, I would agree uh, with that vision uh, of yours as well. Um, based on what you just said, like that decentralized exchanges will be subject to regulation and licensing requirements and KYC, what will then be their USP or like if we compare then centralized crypto exchanges from the future decentralized crypto exchanges, like what that what will that uh, look like? If any one of you has a, has an input on that, maybe quickly and maybe an exception to law not being as fast as if the government would be incentivized to create a smart contract uh, to put it out there in the DEX. It just occurred to me, uh, but uh, I think the the. Hmm. Let me sort my thoughts. I'll give it. A, give it to, to, I'll give it back to the other ones. Maybe, maybe like one thought. Um, I, I think taxes have a big advantage over central exchanges by transparency. So um, the technology allows you to be transparent. So everybody who trades on that DEX knows where the funds are. They can actually also um, participate on both sides, right? So you can actually. Um, provide liquidity to some pools and then trade in other pools. So it's a way more in taking and like still decentralized manner to offer that kind of service versus a centralized exchange. We have order book and lots of things are happening in the back end nobody knows about. So even if both models would be regulated, I think that 
decentralized model is still, for me, the more attractive one because it's more inclusive. From yeah, very valid uh, point you're making. Business perspective, you have the decentralized centralized aspect here. You have a company behind, yes, revenue driven. But from the decentralized exchange, it's despite the structure not there, but I see there's a potential when structured well, with also coupled with the tech, it can be a way to generate unconditional income for a broader community and serve for a broader aspect. This is my opinion. That's why I like decentralized exchanges, but it needs development in every aspect, from tech to also some either it's internal regulation under the community or from the upper layer. <laughs> <laughs> you want to yeah, I mean, and th this is the, the kind of uh, thought I wanted to put out there. I think creating a code, a machine or an NPC that just generates revenue after you've spent a lifetime coding it is, is, a, is a wonderful thing. But I think creating something that kind of adheres to the best execution principle of Mifid or Mika um, would be even more wonderful because your DEX is adhering to the various regulations that you have out there as well. So I think the real innovation in DEXs or in whatever variant that you develop down the line is creating a, a, a regulatory compliant code somehow driven by some variables or parameters and by, by a, a governance structure that is decentralized. Maybe that's one of the ways of achieving that decentralized structure um, I think MakerDAO is one of those examples where some of their decisions are really up for vote rather than, but you still have central counterparties making the decisions down the line. But those scenarios, and I think this is the way forward, I would expect it to go for DEXs because it's brilliant. I mean, I, do I want to wait uh, until eight o'clock in the morning if I'm an all, a night owl to pick up my post from the post office? I want to go whenever I have time to. And this is the whole prospect of DEXs. So you want to exchange and you want to interact with the financial dimension uh, digitally at when, whenever is convenient to you. Hmm? Yeah, no? um, so I would use another metaphor. And again, I made it up. So. Um, I feel like the world of DEXs will have some similarities with what happened to corporate media. So we had corporate media, like, and they have their audience and they have their agenda and they have their budgets and they kind of exist. But you have a lot of like independent media and independent journalists and creator economy and they're very fragmented. They serve their specific niches and they, uh, try to stay under the radar if they want to like say something that maybe is original or not politically correct or whatever. And I think that would be a path for DEXs. So right now, I mean, there is very little, I mean, difference between political or BuzzFeed or CNN in terms of like how they're organized and what they follow. And then there are many, many journalists who say whatever they make up, right? And I think the same thing will happen with the decentralized world. Some of the DEXs who want to be big and serve corporate institutional customers would probably go towards centralization and compliance and regulations, but there would be many, many smaller pools who would serve their niche, uh, list assets that others wouldn't list and be kind of doing their own things. That's how I would see it. Thank you very much for your very diverse uh, outlook for the future of DEXs and all the insights that you have shared uh, today uh, with, the, with the audience. Um, so we have some time for questions in uh, case... Yeah, okay, there is at least one. <laughs> oh, hi. Thank you so much for, for the panel and for the insights. It's super interesting to see people coming from Tradfine to, into crypto and bringing that knowledge with them. I have a question for Dr. Habach. Um, when you're the head of compliance for a bank that has uh, entities in so many jurisdictions and one or multiple jurisdictions are on a gray list, how complex makes this, how, co how complicated this makes your job or uh, what kind of measures do you have to, to take in order to satisfy FATF? Thank you. Yeah, interesting question. Obviously, I, w I cannot go into too many specifics, but I think the golden rule of adhering to anything or, I mean, if you are given an obstacle or, an, or a complication, you just make sure that you're comfortable with the solution that you seek. So if 
the AML evaluation pursuant to FATF of the UAE is weak, then you just enhance it a little bit to make sure that it is considered equivalent regardless of what the jurisdiction, so the UAE would deem in itself as appropriate. So in our case, it's the FSRA of the ADGM. So, I mean, you already have this gold standard, and you have the you know, group structures and how it's structured, you have your policies, your minimum uh, expectations. And I think this is also, and just to kind of bring the crypto side into it, this is also what you inherently have to do irrespective of where you are. So you have the FATF considerations, you have BIS, and you have uh, the, the OFAC sanctions of Tornado Cash, and you have the various other regular, I mean, do I legally need to adhere to them? No. Do I want to so as to not get in trouble? Yes. Um, and I think that's the, that's the approach. Huh? Okay, thank you. And I have another short question for the whole panel, just to make it a bit more fun. <laughs> <laughs> as 2024 started, then we're talking about DeFi and we're talking about DEXs. And on DEXs, we find a lot of cool meme coins. <laughs> Can you share with us what kind of meme coins do you like for, for this year? <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer, no uh, investment advice here. <laughs> <laughs> I like Elon, so I would say Doge. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sounds like a good one. <laughs> uh, one of my New Year uh, resolutions this year was to stay away from meme coins. So, uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> from my end as well, I'm <laughs> dedicated to my project for the Edelcoin project as a stablecoin. We love assets, we love to tokenize assets, we keep it on the safe side. Meme coins, yes, it's an interesting part, but not from my end. Would it be an option to create a stable meme coin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like decentralized bank. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no pump and dump. <laughs> Super. Uh, okay. Do we have another question? I think I saw. Would, you, would we have time? Hi, um, thanks for uh, for the panel. I have a question. You talked about regulation a lot, <laughs> and and um, what do you think is sort of the sticking point, the challenge right now? Is it the absence or not clarity of what the regulation is? Is it the absence of tools to adhere that to the regulation that exists that could be applied, or is it something else? Uh, one of the other panels I heard there was a question like, for example what do you actually regulate in, in DeFi when you don't have an organization but we talked there might be somebody behind so just what's what's stopping that that trend right now i'll give a very short answer because i think we're in minus seconds um it, it's all of the above you lack definitions you lack experiences you lack exposures you lack clarity you lack the convergence you're focused on your, your jurisdictions. So you go for the gold standard by trial and error. So you go for the highest standard and then it's a race to the bottom. What, I mean, similar to the traditional finance perspective, you're supposed to identify the ultimate beneficial owners of companies. So they start off at 25% and then they thought, oh shoot, uh, people could structure companies to only have a beneficial owner of 24, 24, 24. Oh shoot, then let's go to 10%. So, and then at some point you would say as a regulator, okay, here we draw the line because otherwise you'd employ way more compliance officers than even have I don't know uh, restaurants in your neighborhood and um, but I, I think it's it's that clarity it's that exposure and I think we're slowly navigating through it uh, and and it's all of the above so sorry the for lack, the, of, the lack of rules you, you put it in the first place I mean Mika didn't uh, define didn't, exactly. on how you structure a DEX and the SEC is still exploring how they define exchanges on the blockchain. Um, there is a disparity between utility and security and asset-backed tokens between uh, the FINMA perspective and the EU. So you still need that convergence. You still have some loopholes, but as soon Plus all the cross-border, which is like... Cross -border, <laughs> huh? But in Decentraland, there are no borders. Huh? So you need to kind of adhere to everything at the same time, which is then unclear. There will be one more question in the audience. Okay, let's go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, we discussed uh, Curve, uh, and uh, I would like to ask Yana first and the others to address, because Curves, um, 
attack was different than the others, uh, and it was saved. They all say was, this. It, it, it was too big to fail. Uh, unlike other decentralized exchanges, it's actually a money market fund. It's where the stable uh, coins are done, uh, coins are exchanged. So, um, the, the in, if you look at it, it was actually saved by Binance and Justin Sun because they didn't want the position of curve token being uh, given to Aave as a collateral asset to lose value that it gets liquidated, which would create a major meltdown uh, that the whole crypto ecosystem was about to fail. So it was saved uh, by the ecosystem. So um, uh, what I would like to, I mean, we're talking about regulations, but in 2008, Lehman Brothers and all those collapse, uh, uh, collapses happened. Uh, we uh, kind of like criticized the government by interfering with the market mechanism. But in the Curve case, it was solved very quickly by the ecosystem. So no regulator had to step in and uh, a, a too big to fail entity, a decentralized exchange, which does money market things, was saved. So what are your thoughts on that? Because they didn't save um, when Solana uh, was collapsing with the FTX. Uh, Solent uh, liquidity drained out, radium drained out, most other DEXs drained out, but no one interfered. But in Curve, they did. Um, so, if the question is whether society, whatever, should interfere, I would say if it's the government money, taxpayer money, like I'm a libertarian, so I would say no. At least not with my money, please. I mean, <laughs> if other taxpayers agree, you do whatever you want. If it's a voluntary help, you shouldn't regulate it. Th that because was exactly my point, because no taxpayer money was used. It's not the first yeah. time that it happened. Like, we remember the DAO hacker like, stuff and a few others where com community mobilized and helped identify any issues and developers said, I'm available, I, I can code for you, whatever. So it's not the first time, it's not the last time that happened. It doesn't happen only in crypto space. I believe it, it happened a lot with the traditional finance as well. Uh, whistleblowing is another like socially acceptable norm where people trying to risk their life or contribute their efforts to help others. So it does happen, but regulating it or expecting it is uh, a different thing. I wouldn't do it. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists and also to the audience uh, for your interesting questions and your attention. And uh, please, big applause for... Thank you.